Hello, I'm resident of Collinwood for YouTube, Jewel Sades. That's my buddy Alan Gallant. That's my buddy Daniel Culver. That's my buddy Patrick McCray. We're here to review the movie My Summer Story, chosen by Daniel Culver. Yep. Uh, so, Daniel, when did you first see this movie, Dan? Oh, actually, um, I saw it pretty recently. Like, uh, Do you remember what, that, um, what day I suggested it? I believe this was a week ago. Oh, yeah, so I'd say about a week ago, yeah. But I have heard of it, like, for years, you know, but... You know, it's one, it's, for some reason, not any, oh, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, what? Go ahead. So it's not on any streaming service. Oh, you well, know, I on, guess. It's yeah, on it's YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah, it is. So I'm sure that's how you saw it. Yep. Um, yeah, this was released direct to video. It was oh, yeah, supposed to be a, the a theatrical release, but for whatever reason, they went direct to video with it. Oh, yeah. Um, there is a Blu-ray, you know, as well. Wow. Does it have supplements? I wonder. I'm not sure. Like, I'd have to look into that. Yeah. Yeah, because that was in an era when they did supplements for everything. Yeah, yeah. I know, Lincoln. Well, go ahead. Get it over with. Alan, what did you say? This <laughs> uh, I, again, I had heard of it for a number of years, but I never actually watched it because of the direct-to-video thing, I guess. I don't know. But um, I watched it for the first time yesterday. I'm oh, yeah, I forgot. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead, Dan. Oh, yeah. One thing we forgot to mention is, um, it was released as, um, all, you know, it runs in the family. I know it's kind of weird, but yeah, they changed yeah. the title. Yeah, it had a different title. It did. Yeah. Yeah, Wait. it had been talked about for a long time. That you know, Bob Clark had been trying to make a sequel to a Christmas Story for quite a while, because that's a well with a lot of water in it. Mm -hmm, it is. Well, that actually explains well, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, Darren McGavin was not in a position. Lincoln, okay, enough. <laughs> it's like the cat version of the old man. Yeah, um, uh, yeah you know, and and the you know, the original cast obviously was too old or was unavailable to right. uh, to make it. Although I think maybe one of the bullies is the same, the redheaded. Yes, the redheaded kid. I yeah. think is the same. Uh, a um, a, that didn't ever bother me at all. I thought the cast was really well done, and it did not bother me that there were different people playing all the different characters. It's so. Uh, now, I, I think the, the challenge of this movie, so the, you know, the premise of it is that it takes, you know, it's, it's further adventures of Ralph Parker kind of looking at summer vacation with the same uh, nostalgia that he looked at at Christmas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the challenges, though, is that, you know, with Christmas, you have so many institutions that everyone experiences. You know, you had school to bounce off against, and they got a little right. of that at the beginning, but then, and, you know, you have all of the Christmas rituals and summer's rituals are, are far less defined. Um, they are. There's there's summer camp. There's there's playing baseball. There's you know, but you're like right. They're less defined, and not everybody experiences them the same way. The the yeah. you know, this is based on stories by Gene Shepard, who was a DJ at WOR in New York, and would often just make these things up at night, mm -hmm. and then write them down, or write them down and read them on the radio. Uh, but, uh, but that's how these, these came about. And if you follow the Ralph Parker stories, you know, here's an interesting thing. Do you know where Christmas story story was originally published? It's published in Playboy. Oh, I didn't awesome. know that actually. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, um, and that, you know, is evidence of sort of how hip Gene Shepard was and, uh, the, the breadth of what Playboy published at yes. the time you know and um and so that was uh, that was the place to find that um if you look at the ralph parker stories you can find them going over his entire life you know winding up with him in new york you know isolated in a skyscraper yeah. sort of going through this box of toys and, and other memorabilia as his only connection to something authentic it's it's a really interesting thing because it it kind of looks at you know that this was the best time of his life and and that that you know what has he and what have we lost as a culture is i think one of the one of the pieces of subtext in here but you can lincoln no one wants to see that um they all know who you are um but but they uh but you i think one of the one of the maybe mistakes of this movie is trying to go back to the well too close to where the first one was, because you can do stories about Ralph in high school. There's a great prom story. There's a great Indy 500 story, because you know these are Indiana-based tales. 
Yeah. Um, there, uh, so he, he deals with all sorts of rites of passage. You can deal with him in the army. Uh, and and Ralph Parker's take on the army. Of course, you don't get the old man there. And you even have uh, some amazing college stories, including one that becomes the title of its own collection, A Fistful of Fig Newtons, that's about Ralph Parker in college on the GI Bill uh, in a laxative eating contest. Oh, God. <laughs> and it's, but, you know, that and that is that essential Gene Shepherd because right. it takes something that's sort of sweet and then and then put laxatives in it, yeah. um, so to speak. Uh, yeah, yeah they, there's they, they definitely a, a sort of laxatives a, and then eat fig newtons to see what yeah. happens. There's a there's a there is sort of a wide eyed um, misdirection of some of the satirical moments uh, in these movies. Uh, so I'm thinking the stories probably have some of that as well. That sort of like you said, the nostalgia and. Or is it is it pretty much straightforward stuff? It's just no. It's it, there is no, it, it is the same Christmas story, especially. Yeah. Is the exact shepherd mix. Yeah. Of of childhood seen through adult eyes, but without being condescending towards it. Right. Right. All right. It is. That's that's where that's where any any of the absurdities you get are coming. They're they're honest. They're straight. They're not. They're not commenting on it or making fun of it or anything else it's just there no he he gives it the same stakes that adult life has right right it's like the old man is 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 a is a you know the he's he's crazy i mean he 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 goes off the deep end all the time uh very much in some ways but he's crazy (laughs) the war with the bumpuses really escalates here Um, (laughs) yeah that's true because he doesn't have the furnace to battle right and these stories are taking place. I kind of figured out when they're happening. So I think maybe we did we talk about that the other night, trying to figure out when they were happening. Uh, I had a conversation yes. with somebody about that. Yeah. And Shepard was born in 21. So we're talking 30s, early 40s. Early 30s. Early 30s. Yeah, early but, 30s. That's right. Because when we start, he's quite young. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. but they play with time here because he talks about television. Mm-hmm. Coming up, and so that would put this at the latest in 1946. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. And they had television sets in 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 the windows of the appliance dealers uh, back then. Uh, in, in Summer Story. Uh, no, but I'm saying that that in that in that 1940s period, before everybody yeah. had a television set, people would yeah. go down to the appliance store and watch television. Oh, sure. Windows. Sure. Well, 1946 is the first year that we really consider network TV going on the air. Right. Is that Dumont? With with four networks. That's right. Dumont. Dumont. Two two NBCs and and a CBS? No, I think NBC. NBC NBC had two radios. That's right. Yeah, they they had two radios. But it was NBC, CBS, I think ABC and Dumont. Yeah. 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 ABC was always fledgling. It stayed fledgling for like 20 years before it finally caught a foothold in them in, in, you know in terms of viewership but yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah uh charles groden is here starring in this movie a uh, very Excellent. very talented actor oh yeah great. Um, now here's a question for you guys with my summer story uh i love how they do the gypsy concept and they <laughs> pull, pull the kid. Oh, yeah, I love um, it too. but yeah, his war, Charles Gordon's character, the old man, his war with the uh, hillbillies from hell was just hilarious. <laughs> and, yes, and that's that's wildly politically incorrect now. You could oh, not totally. get away with that at all. The the only thing that makes it palatable, I think, to modern audiences is that the, the hillbillies get the better of him. I mean, oh, they're yeah, totally true. guileless. They just they don't care. And and at one point, they actually join in because they that they think... He's trying to start a hoot nanny. Start a hoot nanny. <laughs> oh, that's true. I like when the one um, destroys his own deck. You know what the funny part is? I didn't realize until like things start happening that they just actually destroy their own deck. It's like, wow, that was actually a pretty bad decision. Yeah. That was one of the more diabolical moments. <laughs> it was. Dude. Dickie. <laughs> Dickie. I think they they pull off the air very well here though, for it being, like I said, the 40s, I believe. Um, they do a Late very 40s, good, I think. Yeah. yeah, they do a really good job here because I do remember 
I think it was my grandfather or my great or my great uncle saying about tops in the 40s. And so when a kid goes out to seek a top and to rival with this other because he's rivaling this this other kid, he goes, I just want to I just want to beat him one time and it's the worst it's worse it's a tie. <laughs> it's just too good. I love yeah. how it goes down in the sewer and they're watching through the great Great camera work, by the way. That's the thing this movie doesn't get enough credit for is its camera work with the kids. Um, well, Jewel, do you remember Murder by Decree when we watched that a few months ago? Yeah. The, yeah, the same director. Cool. Oh, wow. Cool. Oh, I wait, was it? Okay. I didn't even notice that. Um, sorry. <laughs> Give me one the, the thing I like about that shot is, is as the uh, uh, <laughs> as the tops go further down and further down so to the hopes of the children it's sure. just it's great but wasn't this directed by the same person as the first one yes Bob, oh, Bob so. Clark yeah amazingly Benjamin, talented Benjamin oh, fun fact, Robert okay. Clark yeah Benjamin fun Robert fact he also Clark. directed oh sorry yeah well yeah fun fact he also directed the original version of Black Christmas yeah, yeah. he did that and Porky's the original Porkies. Oh the my original god. Porkies. Oh yeah, but it's just kind of funny though if you think about it, because he directed Black Christmas, then he went on to direct a Christmas story, you know. He could combine the two and do Black Christmas story. That's right. Oh yeah. Black Dynamite has Christmas. Um, That's what's kind of funny too, because I've seen some people say like this is just another adaptation of Gene Shepard's story, but no, this is technically a sequel to a Christmas story if you really think about it, because it is as oh, it the is. same director. It is, okay. it's meant to be. Yeah, it's totally meant to be. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, that's yeah, it's kind of funny how people try to say, like, yeah, it's just based on, but no, it's like, that's the funny part is, even though, even though it has a different name, it's more of a sequel than A Christmas Story 2 is, and, oh, and you know, obviously A Christmas Story Christmas. Yeah, sure. Easily. Yeah, yeah, the whole, oh, yeah, the whole, confusion. whole opening okay. scene tells you that. The changing of the seasons happens. They unthaw in oh, Indiana. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's you know, true. talks about it, so. Oh, well, that's what's true too. That's what's kind of funny because I am I noticed that immediately too. Like that's what's kind of funny because, like I said, some people don't recognize this as a sequel, but it literally mentions the events of a Christmas story. It beginning. does. It references the winter time and how they're thawing out of it, and then summer comes. Yeah, and the BB gun. Yeah, yeah. the BB gun right, reappears. Yeah. Shot in the rear. Shot yeah. in the rear. That's right. Oh yeah. And he wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that, so he didn't lose the gun. Uh-huh. <laughs> Did Except you shoot him out again? Yeah, yeah, that was great. I, I'm a little surprised they didn't give him the glasses. Yeah, that is, yeah. Yeah, they took the well, trademark of that character. Well, they did for a few seconds, but I don't, I don't get that either, to be honest. Yeah, maybe those were so associated with Peter Billingsley, who'd been doing advertisements and all sorts of other stuff. He maybe. ended up doing special effects. I think he does special effects modeling and stuff now. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I... Yeah, I can't. I, it was funny also when he wrote the book report on um the adult story the or whatever it was, you know. Yeah. Sex yeah. wrenched, but unreadable classic. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm not familiar with that to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Few people. Are. No one is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's there was a there was a period when you had older books. Like the Decameron and and the books of a guy named Rabelais, and for the longest time that was the that was the closest thing to you know pornography that they had, That's and uh, were these these strange classics that you sort of get away with having around, no one really noticed, but uh, you know by the time you know the sixties would pull around, there was you know not as much of a need for that. Mm-hmm. No, I mean we read we read tell we read tales from the Decameron when I was a sophomore in high school. We had an English professor that cracked that open and said, "What do you think this? Huh? What do you think about this?" Uh, and then you know he dated it and said, "Hey, this has been going on for longer than you have. Come on." Yeah. <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, Shepard had begun work on the film in 1989 after wrapping up production on the television film Oldie Op. Noodles. Bobby Hop Noodles, Haven of Bliss. Yeah. Well, yeah, we were talking about that. Yeah, earlier. Really... He he admitted making the sequel mainly as a money making enterprise. When he saw the amount of royalties he was making off telecasts and re-releases of a Christmas story, uh, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. This movie actually 
I think it captures the spirit of the original very well. Right. Um, the new cast, the even though it's a completely different cast, they capture the characters from the first movie very well. Do you guys think that they that the whole cast had maybe watched the original Christmas? Story? Oh, I'm sure yeah. they were familiar. I'm pretty sure so. they had. And 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 but, if they if they weren't inclined, they were probably asked to. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, true. But 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 also when you've got Mary Steenburgen and when you've got Charles Grodin, they're going to do their own performances. Yes. Oh yeah. And uh, and they do. You know, Grodin's Grodin's really interesting in this. It's tough to do a double blind though because the script is fun I and mean, it's a fun movie to watch, but it's not quite as good as a Christmas story. And the old man is is exaggerated even more than I think he is in a Christmas. It's one thing to have him sort of, you know, cantankerously going off against a, a furnace or a tire yeah. that he's having to change or something like that. And it's another thing for him to disturb the entire neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> but but that is oh, yeah. pure Gene Shepard. Yeah. Um, and the old man was lovably maniacal um, uh, in this. He's more identifiable, I think, in in Christmas Story. Mm. You know, because, because they are more mundane everyday battles that yeah that he, he has he has small have. aspirations he has the, the, those aspirations that are contained in one or two houses yeah, yeah. Or, or feuds that are contained in one or two houses and it's you know comedy always gets short shrift when it comes to the oscars and i have long maintained that i don't remember the other big performances of 1983 but i really think darren mcgavin should have been up for best actor yeah. For for Christmas Story, it is it is it is probably the performance from 1983 that has had the most life, has been seen the most, is the most beloved. Uh, I think has had a a, a a just a greater life to mm-hmm. it than in other films, you know. But they had no idea the legacy the Christmas Story would have. No, 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 no. Sure. but yeah, it's no, it's a great, it is a great performance. I mean, it was also in the early days of memes. You saw a ton of the old man memes with the, especially with the with the lamp, you know, the leg uh, of lamp. Oh yeah, you know what's actually, you know what's funny at my local Dollar General. You know how um there's bobbleheads. Yeah. Around Christmas time last year, they actually had bobbleheads of the that lamp. Oh sure, oh, that, yeah, they've been I'm commercializing for a while. Least. Yeah. No, that's pretty iconic. Actually, uh, I remember a few years ago they were actually selling full size, like replicas of the damn thing. Because I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, them. it'd be kind of cool to have, like, but I don't know if I'd really. It'd be kind of pointless for me to buy, to be honest. It, it, it was a great. Must. It was a great iconic sort of moment, and it's like. Mom is so long suffering at this point. I mean, it's just it's it, it it serves so many purposes. Well, and they try to they try to shift that onto the mom with the gravy boats. Yes, they did. Yeah. Her obsession with you know getting this free thing and and yeah. how wonderful that would be, and it ends up just being a menace around the house. And right. Oh yeah. I would be on. I'm. I'm gonna be honest with you. I would be pretty pissed if that happened to me too. It's like the, you're supposed to get these free plates and shit, and they. Got a bunch of gravy boats, you know. Gravy boats, three or four times in a row. Yeah, <laughs> started hurling them. Now, do you recognize the movie theater manager? Yes, yeah. from yeah. Beetlejuice. Otho. Yeah, yeah. It's Otho from Beetlejuice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I recognized him right away. And just as greasy <laughs> as he yes. was in Beetlejuice, too. One of the things that I like about this movie is that it increases the cast of characters. In yeah. Holman, Indiana, it, it it you know you you get more okay. So here is the movie theater manager, mm-hmm. here is the dime store guy, right. uh, and and they begin to 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 expand that more and more. And I kind of wonder if the thinking was well, if this is a success, now there's going to be a larger cast of characters that people will come back to see again and again, because as I said, Shepard wrote a lot of Ralph Parker stuff. He did. If I had if I had been in charge of the franchise. I don't think I would have done my summer story because it would have been too close, but I would have done uh, a prom story, uh, you know, a, a, a racetrack story, an army story, uh, a college story. And each one would have, you know, good, yeah. matured Ralph a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that would have been a, a cool way to to do that. 
but I, I don't think, I think today that may be how they would do it. Right. But I'm not sure. I hate to say that we have more vision in Hollywood today than they did then. Well, certainly they, had, but, they, they had the vacation movies to inspire them. I mean, that, I in terms of franchise, thing, you they know, they, they have been looking at those. And, and yeah. like you say, with the expansion of the adventures and the cast and all that sort of thing. Sure. Yeah, that's, um, that's one good thing about the newest one, because... It could be confusing. For those that don't know, they had a Christmas story two, which is a cash grab. Which let's be honest, but then they had a Christmas story Christmas. But that's one good thing is they finally decided to have a time skip, and now Ralphie's an adult, and they got the guy that played him in the original to come back. Yeah, you know? that's he correct. Them. Yeah, yeah. Um, even the guy that played Randy came back. You know, and as you know, the um, the guy that played Farkas came back too. Scott Farkas. Oh, yeah. One of my all-time favorite villains. And um, no, the uh, spoilers for those who haven't seen that movie, but yeah, for some reason he's a cop. That makes total sense. Sure. The irony of it—it's totally. It makes total sense. That's what I kind of like, though. Is like you know he expected him to be like, you know, mean, but it turned out he was actually friendly. I know I'm I'm ruining it for people who haven't seen it yet, but you know. No, that's fine. It's all oh, yeah. Good. You all had time though. It's been what two yep. years? Yeah, yeah. they they had time. They wanted to see it. They'd see it. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. I know it was exclusive to Max, but I don't think it is anymore because I think they played on TV later on, you know. I wouldn't be surprised if they popped it on the Hallmark Channel or one of those. For yeah. Sure. Oh, that's true. Um, that one is good, but the problem is that yep. wasn't written by Gene Shepard, you know. It wasn't. Yeah, no. Gene died a little while ago. And, you know, I mean, the guy was born again in 1921. Yeah. So, you know, he'd be 100 yeah, now. True. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, here's here's a question for you guys. Charles Grodin, the way he played the old man, I think in every way, do you guys think it adds to Darren McGavin's character? I think it stands on its own. It's 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 a and we talked about before. He sort of amplifies some things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's I it, think yeah. I think he does a good job of it. But the uh, script you know, amplifies his, his, his yeah his maniacal um, when he has these sort of strokes of mania, um, which he does. He kind of he just kind of freaks out. He really uh, does. It it works. It, it especially with the with with the re response of the kid, you know, and everything else that's going on. Wow, he's really crazy. But this is fun, you know, and and let's go ahead and do it. Um, and, um, so yeah, I mean, he's, he's committed, um, no pun intended to that, uh, that mania and he does a really good job with it. And I think Mary Steenburgen does a good job of sort of balancing that off in certain yeah. scenes. So, yeah. Yeah. Until I, she, until she goes to jail and she kicks ass. Well, yeah, she finally, she kind of snaps too, but in, in a kind of a different way. She's, right. she's like standing up for something like, hey, you're ripping me off. I can't stand this anymore. Whereas yeah. the old man is like, I hate my neighbors and I'm going to get revenge, you know. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he's like enjoying every minute of it too. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. Oh, I like when like he finally got like, Revenge, well, kind of, but that turns out they moved. That's right. Basically, all he did was irritate the entire neighborhood again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> At 3 a.m. Do you think Shepard's character of the old man inspired, uh, somewhat inspired the character of Al Bundy? Uh, no. I, I, in all, in all deference, no. Um, because, He's a different kind of weird. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the old man in A Christmas Story, which was the only thing that was out really, you know, prior to Married with Children coming out, was he he was built to be a a typical example. And yeah. when he would get cantankerous about something, it was about a matter of principle and it was a matter of ego and it was a matter of pride, but it was never a matter of madness. Right. He was right. just he was he was supposed to be identifiable as everyone's father. Right. With, and with any time he would go off, it would be, uh, be because he was having erotic fantasies about the neighbor or, you know, and he would be, behave foolishly. But a lot of men behave foolishly in the presence of beauty that way. So, um, he, yeah, he is more of an everyman. Yeah. Al Bundy is built to be crass. Yeah. 
and he was born that way. And and yeah. the old man is a somewhat classier act. Yeah. You know, and here's here's case in point. Uh, the old man is never uh, caustic towards his children. Yeah. No. He As is fact, uh, he sort of conspires with. Yeah. yeah. He's very loving towards his wife. Mm-hmm. Um. So. Uh, so yeah. Those. But, but Al Bundy is an openly revolutionary character. Yeah. You know. And he's revolting in every sense. That's right. <laughs> you know. Um, you know. Actually, it's interesting you say that about how he's a loving father because. Many people might not be aware of this. I didn't know this until, until I read an article that mentioned it. You realize that, as you know, um, he's the one that you know got Ralphie the uh, the Red Rider Rider BB sure. gun. But what you mm-hmm. notice is, um, his dad was the only person he didn't ask. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's a really good insight. How how wonderful. He just knew he he was a boy <laughs> once. Yeah. 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 Uh, you guys talked about the huge cat, the bigger cast with this. It gives them, it even adds to the cast, giving them a bigger town feel. I love how the neighborhood reacts to the old man's pranks. It's very yeah. natural. Um, yeah. And I do how, like how they transition from, because you do, it's summer, school's out, and you get how they build the showdown between the kid who never loses to Ralphie. And I also love how they build the, the the uh, what is it? It's a fair, isn't it? That the where he gets the top a fair. It's sort no. of world's fair. Yeah, yeah. World's fair. yeah. It's it's this. Yeah, it's this little Chinese guy. He's got this little exotic shop, and he's. Well, that's so, where he gets. Yeah. This is the this is the exposition. Uh, yeah. The yeah, exposition. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 You like how his deck? I mean, well, the old man called um called the cop son of a bitch three times. <laughs> yeah, and he finally got away with it the last time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, guys. What's I? I think this is. I haven't seen too many Charles Gordon films. I think this is the only one I've actually seen. I may have seen other movies. Really? I can't remember. Um, because I was trying to remember. I don't. I don't. I can't remember if it, whether it was him or John Ritter that did Problem Child. Um, it was John Ritter. Yeah. It was okay. Yeah, Groden was just a little older. By by the time Groden was was a very big actor in the eighties. Was yeah, he He also had about simultaneously with his with his film career, he was also um, a um, talk show host for a couple of years. Yeah, the talk show host thing, I think, kind of killed his film career. Well, temporarily it did anyway. Yeah, I think it did. Uh, I think. What did he do after this? I mean, after this I'd movie, have to look. And you might be not right. Much. He might have kind of dampened it, if not killed it. Yeah. You know? Well, what happened? You know, he got this inexplicable position with CNBC doing this talk show, and it was a very good talk show. It was. He was very good. But when the uh, OJ trial happened, he became just single-mindedly obsessed with the OJ trial. He did. He was very yeah. opinionated about it too. Yes, he was. Or, oh. Yes, he was. And he and Dick Cavett would really go at it because mm-hmm. Groden was was sort of a more modern sensibility in terms of well, let's let's keep this off the air. Let's you know have yeah. some decorum on television. And Cavett was, I remember he was in a debate with Dick Cavett that I saw on CNBC because Cavett had a show show on yeah. there at the same time for a while. Yeah. And Cavett said, well, you know, if they didn't get the type of TV that has an off switch. They need to go back to the store, get one, and not let the door hit them on the ass on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Cabot really just laid yeah. Groden flat. Yeah. Well, uh, Cabot also, um, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Dick Cabot started his career as an actor as well. Yeah. So he had that sensibility. He, he had a BS, you know, sense about yeah. certain things that he felt were BS, and he was not um, too shy about finding a way to say that either either slyly or right out right out front depending on who he was talking to so i remember where i was seeing charles Gordon and i just looked at this he did beethoven one and two that's right um, and clifford now, yeah with okay. martin short yes yeah. yes uh, you guys that's what he did after this in, two, in 2010's career resurgence in the 2010s Groden made more frequent acting appearances, guest starring on television shows such as Law and Order, Special Victims Unit, and the Michael J. Fox Show. Uh, Groden had 
several supporting roles in films, including uh, Barry Levinson's The Humbling, um, 2014, and Taylor Hackford's The Comedian, 2016. He had a prominent supporting role in Noah uh, Boombach's While You Were Young, 2015, played a celebrity documentary filmmaker and father of one of the lead characters. In 2015, Groden was cast in a recurring role in Lois C. K K's FX show, Louie, as Dr. Bigelow. I remember that. Um, so, yeah, he he did he did have a bit of resurgence. He did. He did. But he also it sounds like he did a lot of TV. Yeah. yeah, and he also did a lot of writing. He wrote at least three books. Oh, yeah. He was, yeah, he was he was kind of a polymath when it came to uh, the arts, I guess you could say. He was writer, he was really, actor. Yeah, he was famous for these incredibly weird appearances on The Tonight Show. Yes. Where he was openly hostile to Johnny. Yeah. And apparently and Johnny didn't mind because he kept having him come yeah. back. Oh. Yeah, no, Johnny enjoyed the shtick of it. Yeah. And uh, and I think Groden made it very obvious off stage that this is what he was going to do. Right. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. It was like um, it, it, it was like um, there were certain other people that that could do no wrong with Johnny Carson. Um, Burt Reynolds was one of them. Burt Reynolds yeah. would come on and throw pies in his face, you know, and did. <laughs> it was just like it didn't matter uh, because he made him laugh so much. He was just. He'd walk out on stage and it was like having laughing gas on stage um, for years. Yeah. Charles, Charles Sidney Groden, born April 21st, 1935, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Good city for good actors. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, guys, what do you give the scale one to ten? Daniel? Um, I would say seven and a half. Patrick? A six. Oh really? Yeah, I mean I like it. It's just it's just always going to be in a shadow of a Christmas story. Oh it's, yeah, that's true. It's hard to divorce it from that, and and it's a good movie, um, but it is it is challenged. So yeah, maybe I'd reach it up to a seven. Yeah, I'll give it a seven. Al? Yeah, Christmas Story ten, uh, my summer story seven. Yeah. Okay, what's you before I get my what's you guys' favorite scene, Daniel? Um oh you know, um I'm gonna go with uh you know when they lost the tops, you know, because it's like they went all through that trouble and then after all that they end up losing the tops, you know. Yeah, that was pretty funny. That was pretty <laughs> true. You wouldn't think there'd be a topless scene in this movie. <laughs> oh, there it is. Had to be said. <laughs> Had to be said. Um yeah, uh, gosh, a favorite scene in this movie. Um, I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird one. I actually like the way the teacher interacts with the kid over the Decameron. That that she manages in her reappearance because she's one of the other characters who reappears uh, to to inject just a little bit of, of humanity. I, I, I can't predict any of her actions there, but I can sympathize with all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she's very human. She's very, yeah. very human. Alan? Would... Um, I like the maniacal aspect of the old man. So it's, it's, it's the, it's the, when it gets, he f first puts that damn record on and he's just going completely berserk and, and, and mom is just going, what is going on? And then it gets turned around. They decide, oh, he wants to have a hoedown. And, and they just turn it completely around on him. I, I do like, like the right of the Valkyries. Yeah, yeah. And he's going, <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's going, what? <laughs> so I, I just enjoyed that for the sheer sort of uh, vaudeville of it. Yeah. yeah. Jewel, uh, how about you? <laughs> My shit. I've got a couple of favorite scenes in this. This one, uh, when the old man says about taking Ralph fishing, because as a kid, everybody knows when they were taught how to fish, and it makes it makes you feel like a kid again. And when you're slowly starting to become part of the adult conversation and in the adult table, 
that and I love the candy store scene. That is hilarious. The root beer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the callbacks they do to a Christmas story are quick and easy to catch. I mean, it's not, they don't, for a sequel, they don't hover over a Christmas story. They tie it in real quick. You know, you get, yeah, this is the same characters, different actors, but the fact that they tie it in from a story standpoint with the BB gun and all that stuff was smart and really well done in this film. I give, I'll give this a seven and a half. This is really good. Sounds so, good. Yeah. Um, guys, uh, tomorrow is ten thirty. Tomorrow, good for That's the fine final with me. Final That's countdown. good with me. Yeah. Um, is there anything anybody wants to add before we get on out of here? No, I don't think I go. Okay. Uh, links to Daniel Culver's channel, Killenberg will be in the description box. Link to Alan Glantz's YouTube channel, Colin's Port After Dark will be in the description box. Yes, he will dress. I'm sure Alan will dress as Satan, uh, and I look forward to it if you do. Uh, <laughs> that would be hilarious. <laughs> Link to Patrick McCray's Dark Shadows Day book about is going to be a scripture box. Good night, Lincoln. He says good night. Bye, guys. Bye.